there we go hi folks and uh, welcome to another evening of good natured out in nature um, I was kind of going back and forth about whether we should try to do it outside tonight since they did predict rain but um, it's not supposed to start until after nine um, I do have an umbrella just in case <laughs> and I'm kind of under uh, some trees here so that might help too um, unless it starts to lightning then that might not be so helpful um, I don't know um, can you tell me can you hear the birds singing behind me I don't know how much this microphone is picking up um, what I might try to do is um, can you hear it Julia yes so yes. yeah I see it not in your head thank you um, yes. yeah it's fine though I'm gonna just turn this way from it there's a song sparrow and um, one of the mnemonics uh, that we can put to the um, cadence or the rhythm of the song sparrow song is maids 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 put on your tea kettle kettle kettles and um, this one is coming pretty close sometimes to me it just sounds like sweet 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 blah 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 but I'm gonna hold the mic up so you guys can hear and uh, you can decide what songs you uh, what words you want to put to a song of course, now there's an airplane going over. <laughs> um, we've actually got two. That was one that was behind me, and then there's one to the south of me, too. That'll provide some uh, ambient nature sounds, if nothing else. <laughs> okay, with that, um, you know, I did have some slides put together in our old uh, format, what we think of as the traditional uh, good-natured format, the one that has uh, the intro music. So if you guys want to go get your, uh, your ice cream or uh, a cool beverage um, to drink, Here's your chance to do that. We'll have uh, about 15 seconds here of our intro. Oops, so I need to share it with you, don't I? <laughs> it's been so long. Uh, let's see, where's our Zoom? Uh, there we are. Share the screen. There we are. All right, let's try that one more time. No. All right. I swear I got it this time. <laughs> So um, this first item, I, I can't believe I didn't share it with you uh, when it happened a few weeks ago. It's sort of what we would call old news at this point, but um, it's still uh, pretty neat. It was uh, a column, like I think it was uh, that it ran three weeks ago. Look what showed up on my friend Amber's doorstep. Uh, that's a Virginia rail, and yes, that's her planter. Um, and it was um, just out of the blue, literally. Um, Amber's daughter came to her uh, one afternoon and said, Mommy, there's something out on the porch. And I think Amber was like, well, you know, bring it in. You know, maybe it's a box from Amazon. Maybe it's, uh, you know, the mail. Well, her daughter said, well, no, Mommy, actually, it's, it's behind the planter and it's, it's uh, rustling around in there. Um, I don't know what it is. <laughs> they go out move the planter just a little bit and up pops uh, this rail. Um, this was in the, the later afternoon. They don't know how long it was it was out there, but it's a great example of the crazy things that can happen during migration. Uh, this is a bird. Now it, it does um, breed here in the summertime. 
uh, we don't know whether this bird was almost at its destination or whether it was continuing onward. Here's a look at the uh, range map, uh, the blue, uh, the lighter blue color, that's the uh, wintering uh, areas for this bird and then the pinkish orange color that's the uh, summer habitat and you can see we're well within uh, that summer or breeding range. Um, rails are one of many birds that migrate at night. Uh, Amber said that uh, that this bird uh, stayed there <laughs> pretty much like a lawn ornament until it got to be about dusk and then um, then it flew off and has not been seen since. But again, these are uh, birds that we find in our local wetlands. I know at Hickory Knolls, if you go to, uh, not to Carol's wetland, which is the uh, uh, wetland right behind the building, but if you go all the way to the back, we have um, a, uh, an area, in fact, on our maps it's marked as Porzana Pond. Porzana is the, um, the, te the taxonomy might have changed for that, but that's uh, part of the scientific name, or was part of the scientific name for the Virginia Rail. Um, but if you, if you head back there, um, you might be able to hear them. They've got some pretty distinctive vocalizations. I sh did, should have put one in here, but I didn't. They have a, kind of a, a grunting sound that they make. To me, it sounds like a combination of the sound of a pig grunting and the sound of a guinea pig squeaking. Um, put those two together, and um, you just might be listening to a Virginia rail. So they are uh, in their breeding mode now, and yeah, they are in uh, many wetlands around our area. So just a, this is just a little heads up, Susie, this one's for you. Um, this is a bird that uh, is making its presence known uh, throughout, well, probably throughout North America, but especially places like we have here in St. Charles, where we've got a river and we've got lots of vegetation. Um, we have red winged black. So that's um, the territory song of the male, and um, he's been making that now for gosh, over three months, I would say. This is a bird, you know, a lot of times we like to say, oh, and that's the first sign of spring. Well, um, can be, but oftentimes it's, uh, we see robins in the middle of winter. Uh, this is a bird, though, that does migrate short distances. Every once in a while we'll hear about one that overwinters on its own, but they don't tend to do it in the numbers that uh, robins do. Um, but they, the males come back early and they set up their breeding territories. Uh, they're kind of, um, they always kind of <laughs> feel sorry for them because they have a job. Whereas it's, you know, most male birds, it's their job to, to sing and defend and take care of the food, bring the food. Um, this is a bird that does that times two or times three or times four or times five, sometimes times six, if he actually has six females. This is a species that's polygynous, which means it has more than one female per male. So um, in the, the one picture here we see him, he's just kind of um, this though, um, you see this, you know we have uh, a papa redwing who is feeling a little agitated. Now he might be agitated at another redwing, he might be agitated at a human. Uh, this is what they do when they feel they need to defend. They will fly towards, but not directly at the eyes of their target. They, they will come at you from behind. They don't want to put themselves at any risk. If they were to fly towards your eyes, um, you could reach up and swat them. But uh, uh, by, by coming up behind you, they can, um, you know, hopefully get you to move on and, um, and not bother uh, the nesting female. Who looks like this? Doesn't look at all like um, uh, the males, does she? Um, in fact, sometimes people will call me and they'll say, I've got this enormous sparrow nesting in my shrubs. What is it? What kind of sparrow gets that big? This is Mrs. Redwing. So um, 
she makes a lot of the same um, squeaks and, and chirps that her mate does, and they sometimes even participate in the uh, defending of the territory. Um, but right now, they are pretty well occupied uh, in their nests. Red wings tend to nest fairly low. A lot of times, uh, they'll, the nest will be in a position where you can actually look into it. It might be at, uh, say, a height of, uh, say, five feet or four feet. This one here in the cattails was um, probably between three and four feet, uh, so down fairly low. Uh, this is what the eggs look like inside. Um, and yeah, it's happening right now. Sure as shooting, I can, I can almost guarantee that as we get into uh, the later part of the breeding season for these guys, as the young are fledging and they're leaving the nest when dad is in hyper overdrive defending not just the female and the nest and the eggs, but these little babies that are hopping out all over the place. Um, He's going to be bopping people on the heads, and some news outlet is going to pick it up, and they're going to make some reference to uh, Alfred Hitchcock's movie, The Birds. But just bear in mind, they are not here to pick our eyes out. They are just here to um, move us along so that they can move along with the business they have at hand. So this, um, this is a bird. Um, let's listen for a minute to the song of the catbird love to talk about this bird. I probably did it this year, uh, last year at this time too. Um, this is a bird that's in the mimidae or the mimic family, um, which means they, um, they have a lovely song, but not much of it is their own. They incorporate uh, the sounds of other birds. And it's one of my um, little summertime hobbies is to listen to the cat bird. I usually get one in my backyard because as you can see in the, uh, the upper right photo there, they love uh, elderberries. They like the thickness for building nests, the, the, the dense and kind of tangled growth of the elderberries. But then they also like, as we get into uh, midsummer, they like to snack on the berries too. Um, look at that. It just goes on and on and on. So this bird can go on for several minutes at a time incorporating uh, bits of robin and bits of cardinal and bits of wren and bits of blue jay, whatever it is that it happens to uh, feel like um, weaving into its, its, uh, its song. But uh, should you disturb a catbird, then you hear why it's named catbird. You'll hear meow. Uh, sometimes it's... Uh, it sounds, you know, a little more put up like a Siamese cat, meow. And sometimes it's a more of a shorter, um, meow. <laughs> we could go on with all the variations. The point is, it sounds like a cat. Um, I had a woman call me one time. She was convinced she had a lost kitten in her yard, but she could not for the life of her find where it was. Um, and I said, well, where, where is it coming from? She said, well, it's in the bushes. I said, well, is it under the bushes? She said, no, it sounds like it climbed up in the bushes. Pretty sure, because she never did find a kitten anywhere, pretty sure she was hearing the sounds of a catbird. Now, um, this too, this was another column that I had written uh, a couple of weeks ago. Someone sent me a picture over the weekend that showed this phenomenon still happening, so um, I just wanted to, to show you or remind you, I can't remember if we talked about this before, or again, this phenomenon of the shagbark hickory leaf bud. Um, absolutely gorgeous. The, the hickories around here, the shagbarks, they have a, a compound leaf that's held within a pretty good sized um, sheath that happens to be shades of orange and pink and red, yellow. And uh, when it pops open, it, it looks kind of like an iris. In fact, uh, when I wrote this column, I was looking for um, an example. Uh, I, I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to take a picture on my own, so I was looking at our stock photo service, and um, there were pictures on there that looked like what I was looking for, but they were labeled uh, azaleas. So uh, sometimes these um, leaves popping out of these large 
uh, sheaths or buds uh, are mistaken for exotic leaves. Now here's the one that was behind Hickory Knolls. This one uh, popped open during the last uh, heat wave that we had, or the, the one before the last one that we had, not the one we had yesterday, but the one before. Uh, but deeper in our woods, we uh, about midway through the natural area, we do have a grove of hickories, uh, hickories that is um, it's, it's more shaded. This particular hickory we actually planted by the building because we thought if we're going to be hickory knolls, we better have a hickory tree close by that we can point out. So this was a, 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 a plant that was moved to that location, but farther back we've got more hickories. And yes, they do have a, um, a bud that, uh, they might still have some of their buds opening up. So if you can get out there and check it out, I highly recommend it because really cool and it uh, only happens at this time of the year. Now um, don't think we talked about this guy last week did we if we did please uh, correct me um, but this is uh, a giant water bug. Um, we've got a couple the family is Bellastomidae um, this is the Bellastoma genus. Um, there is another genus of... Holy cow! <laughs> hate noise. Um, there's another giant water bug that is probably twice as big as this one. This individual is um, he was a little over an inch long. I would say an inch and a quarter, maybe an inch and a half. The, the, other giant, which I think of in my head is the giant, giant water bug, is more like two and a half or maybe even uh, three inches long. They are huge. Uh, I remember having one on my leg when I was a kid, and I thought it was really cool looking. And then, um, I, and I did not feel a thing, but after the bug left my leg, and it was I was uh, standing in a river, actually, when I noticed it, when um, the bug, uh, you know, got back in the water and, and swam away, I noticed my leg was itchy and then I got this big old whelp that was probably about the size of a baseball. Um, this is a, a predatory aquatic bug. Uh, they are true bugs. So they have the piercing and sucking mouth part. Um, they do inject uh, a little venom uh, or I guess if they're injecting it, yeah, it would be a venom, not a toxin, but uh, to help subdue their prey. But uh, this guy here, thinking about writing a column about him because uh, Father's Day is just around the corner and he really is, in my eyes, Father of the Year. We don't hear a lot about um, uh, fathers doing the rearing of offspring. Uh, seahorses seem to get a lot of credit for that, but locally we don't hear about a lot of... Um, males that uh, that take over the uh, the family responsibilities but in this case the female uh, will deposit her eggs on the back of the male and um, his job he doesn't have to worry about feeding them or anything his main job is to make sure that he keeps himself safe uh, doesn't get eaten and that he uh, he uses his uh, legs to uh, push water over the babies, rinsing them, uh, giving them uh, fresh uh, rinses of water with dissolved, you know, increasing the dissolved oxygen in the water that's flowing over them. So um, uh, this is happening right now. This was a bug that we found during uh, our, uh, it was our King County Certified Naturalist field trip that we did. Um, a week ago, last Saturday, this was out of the uh, the pond at uh, Creek Bend at Leroy Oaks Forest Preserve. So, yeah, you could uh, do a little dipping there, maybe find a, uh, a father of the year of your own. And we also dipped around and we found some babies. Uh, we, I believe we've talked about these in the past, but I don't think we've talked about them recently. These are baby dragonflies. We call them nymphs instead of larvae because they go through um, a gradual metamorphosis, not a complete metamorphosis. That would be um, an insect that would have a, a pupal stage. They would they would pupate like uh, the butterflies and the moths and the uh, beetles and the flies. Those are a few examples of insects that go through a complete metamorphosis. These guys are um, 
similar to say uh, our grasshoppers. Grasshoppers go through um, an incomplete or gradual metamorphosis. So um, little one gets bigger, bigger, bigger through successive molts. Um, this picture is a little dark and muddy, but there are little wing pads on the back of the dragonfly. There's also a couple things we can't see here that are super cool. One is the uh, mouth parts. Uh, dragonflies have what we call a protrusible lower lip, which means it shoots out and it has, uh, it has two spines on it that capture the prey that might be another insect, might be another baby dragonfly. It might be a small tadpole, like the, you know, the little toad tadpoles. It might even be a small fish. Uh, but then they're able to like bring it back in and uh, rip it all up and, and consume it. Supposedly, and I've, I've found a couple of websites that say it's the case, but I, I still haven't found what I feel is a 100% um, uh, trustworthy source that says this is the insect that inspired the alien in the movie Alien. Um, and lots of people say that. Um, if you can find a source for me, uh, I'd, I'd love to see it in writing for sure and not just, well, this guy told me or I heard or um, I was at a program and they said. Uh, but anyway, very cool things that turn into these guys. So up on top, um, we have a dragonfly. You can uh, tell a dragonfly from a damselfly. Now, the damselfly there in the lower right, um, people see those and they say, oh, it's a baby dragonfly because they are by and large smaller than most of our dragonflies. But uh, damselflies, they're, they're in the same order, uh, Odonata, but they are a um, distinctly different group of insects. They have a distinctly different looking uh, nymph. This one, um, oh, you know, I forgot, let's go back. The other part we didn't see on the dragonfly is its gills. Because it is aquatic in this phase of its life, its gills are what it uses to extract oxygen from the water. And the oxygen um, is extracted not up by the face, but at the other end. So yes, we call these uh, nymphs the butt breathers. Um, they, they pull the water in, they uh, take the oxygen out, and then they expel the water. If they happen to be, um, you know, breathing through their gills and they get scared, they can shoot the water out and give themselves a means of jet propulsion to get away from whatever the threat happens to be. Now, if we scoot back over here to the damselfly nymph, you'll see that at the base of the abdomen of uh, these nymphs, uh, there's little structures there. There's three, they look like little tails. Those are actually the gills for um, these insects. So. Um, both are aquatic, but the, uh, the dragonfly has internal gills and the damselflies have external gills. Pretty awesome, huh? So Laura, I have to thank you for these. Um, I just wanted to walk through uh, some of the current uh, floral stars of I'm going to say an unnamed natural area because we do have some sensitive species here. We've got shooting stars. This is the one that um, mums the word on because uh, it's it's one of the plants that gets poached a lot. Um, people hear about it and they want it. Uh, I, I guess it's got some value on the, the market, the black market for native plants. Uh, or maybe they just want it for their yards, I don't know. But white uh, lady slippers, um, they are winding up uh, now relatively soon. Lori, I gotta hand it to you for finding them. They are not real big. Um, they look to me kind of like the shoes that uh, Minnie Mouse wore. Um, but they are um, a really cool and, and fairly unusual plant. We also have uh, yellow lady slippers in Kane County. Um, but this is one that, uh, Laura, you were lucky enough to come upon. <laughs> Appreciate you uh, taking some pictures and sharing them with us. Yeah, not easy to find, but it was well worth the search. Well, and as I recall, you were able to find them even though there was a deadline of, uh, like, what, impending thunderstorms or? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I got back to my car and the, all 
uh, yeah, rain really, a <laughs> deluge but, yeah, happened. But yeah, it was worth it, really worth it. Very cool. Yeah, that, well, and then you found, um, of course, spiderwort, not terribly rare, but always a nice find. But then you also found um, the, uh, we think this is hoary pacoon, right? Yeah. Um, there's, there was some question as whether it was hoary or hairy. I am not the one that's got the tools to tell you which is which, but uh, either way, it's it's not a, a very common plant in this area. But this too, Laura, how, how tall is this plant? You know, it was about as tall as the lady slipper, it, uh, just a little taller. Um, so, you know, I was looking for hoary pacoon, um, but just, <laughs> kept seeing golden alexander towering above everything <laughs> so i was glad i stumbled upon this um yeah so i you know oh i don't know maybe about 15 inches tall at the most wow and this is whoops i didn't mean to do that i was trying to get rid of the black bar here sorry folks um so you could see it's hoary h-o-a-r-y hoary uh and then pacoon P-U-C-C-O-O-N, but I, I see the downfall of, of using the old slideshow method is um, you can't see the name because of the bar, but, and I don't know how to make it go away. Anyway, thanks, Laura, for that, and I think we had one more of yours, too. I called this Canada anemone. Would you agree on that? Um, um, we were, some of us were looking it up. Um, and it, it well, we were using the app on the phone, and they uh -huh. said meadow anemone, and I forgot the other one, so I'm not quite sure which one it is. Okay. It's bigger flower than like you know the woodland anemone. It's just beautiful. Yeah. Well, and it looks like the pollinators were digging it too. Yeah. Huh? yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, so um, we're, we've moved on, folks, uh, the, the, the spring ephemerals, the woodland wildflowers. You know, now that the, the trees are out, uh, the leaves are out on the trees, the canopy is filling in, the light that's coming down um, onto the woodland floor is um, filtered at best, and sometimes it's quite dark there. So uh, it was important that those spring ephemerals got their blossoms up and their seeds uh, set before uh, the sun was blocked from them and now we're starting to see uh, the prairie waking up as we go through the next few weeks I'll uh, try to bring you some more of those pictures as well so with that um, I'm gonna switch slideshow so we'll stop this share and uh, I'm gonna see what I can pull up um, let's see Okay, let's start here. Um, so uh, I, back on, um, let's see, I think it was May, I think it was May 2nd. Uh, I got a text from uh, Rosie, who is the manager over at Swanson Pool here at Pottawatomie Park. And she said, yeah, you know what? We've got this, uh, this nest uh, in the ladies' locker room, and um, we're not sure what to do about it. Well, here's what we're looking at. Um, let's go to this. Um, so I don't know if you can read the sign there. It says, Mother Duck Luna is nesting. Please do not disturb. Thank you. So, uh, you know, on... Um, on May 2nd was no big deal. Pools weren't open. Well, the pools did open this past weekend. It takes uh, plus or minus 28 days to make baby ducks. So um, May 2nd plus 28 days would put us at um, May 30th, which was yesterday, which was um, the hottest of the three-day holiday weekend. And uh, the pool was a very, very busy place. Uh, I texted Rosie earlier today to see uh, what was up with uh, Miss Luna. 
and it turns out she is still sitting there. Now, this, um, in many respects, this was an awesome place to build a nest because it's, it's pretty predator proof. Uh, it's fairly sheltered from uh, winds and things like that, but it's also right underneath a downspout. So, um, I don't know. We're now past 28 days. Um, in fact, when they found the nest with the eggs in it, um, we don't know if she had been already if she'd already been incubating and she got scared away and then came back. So we're not exactly sure when she started sitting on them. But ducks, uh, like many waterfowl, uh, they will um, deposit an egg about every day, and they don't start incubating or sitting on the nest until all the eggs are laid. So uh, this duck. Um, we don't know. I was texting with Rosie about it. You know, what do we do? I said, you know, especially since now it's it's the middle of the week. It's not going to be terribly trafficy, and she's not really blocking any access to anything. So let's let's leave it a few more days. We did have a cool spring, um, even though it was dry for much of it. It, it um, the temperatures were cooler, which uh, even though she's sitting on the nest, they may have not heated up quite as much because of uh, the uh, the cooler temperatures um, and then I don't know what happens when the nest gets soaked like that um, I know ducks they do try to get away from water so that their nests don't get flooded um, you know they, they don't nest right on the bank of the river they don't build a, a floating nest like some birds do these guys will will move away so that they can um, be safe from flooding but uh, I don't know she's she's still hanging in there though and I will keep you posted as to uh, what is hopefully the successful hatching of the eggs there now um, I got a um, I got an email from a couple locally. They sent me some, some different photos, but I was reminded of it when I was on a walk uh, on Sunday. Uh, they sent me, um, they had an Austrian pine that has some orangish growth that looks similar to this. Uh, this is actually a, a white pine. Uh, we can tell it's a white pine. Let's see, did I actually capture? Uh, pines grow their needles in packages and white pines have five uh, needles per package. Austrian pines, I believe, have two. Uh, these are flowers. These are the male or, or the pollen producing flowers of this species. Um, these were all around um, the tree as I walked by. Uh, the female flowers are up a little bit higher. They're clustered near the top of the pine tree and uh, that pollen uh, has to drift uh, up and around, they're they're uh, they're on the same tree, so they're they're monoecious. Monoish, they have the male and the female parts on the same tree, so you only need one tree to make more. Um, but uh, the the couple had written me because they were worried that there was some kind of uh, fungal growth on their pine tree, and it's nope. It just is a sign that it's growing and it wants to make more pine trees. So um, kind of a cool thing. Uh, we don't often give tree flowers the credits that they deserve but these I thought were just really really cool looking and happening right now so um, I was driving to my mom's yesterday uh, this is Gary's Mill Road uh, this is actually right next to um, uh, what I call Elson's Hill um, or Boys Hill um, trying to think of the actual name of the forest preserve Bob I bet you know what it is um, anyway I was walking or I was driving along and I what do I see walking across the road but this turtle now, now take a look at where the turtle is um, it's heading from uh, right to left and um, uh, I actually had to, to steer around it in order to um, you know not hit it but I so I parked and uh, moving at the speed that I move, uh, by the time I was going to rescue the turtle, but by the time I got to it, um, it had pretty much rescued itself. In fact, I kind of anti-rescued it because um, it was making great progress until I got too close, and then uh, she stopped. I, I believe this was a female. Um, the front, uh, 
the front feet there are in shadow so you can't see but she did not have the long nails that we know belong to the male aquatic turtles she hadn't been out of the water very long there must be um a marshy area well in fact i know there's because there's a bunch of dead trees uh, along the uh, the part of the forest preserve that borders the um the road there but uh, had I not gone back to help her, she probably would have already been off the road and into the ditch, but I scared her and she pulled into her shell. Um, I did pick her up briefly because I'm always uh, looking for um, turtle leeches. I haven't had any in a while and I thought it might be uh, a good time to collect some, but I, I didn't see any on this particular turtle. So uh, no leeches in my office at the moment. Um, now this, you know, I, I put these videos in here and then I remembered that we're outside. Oh, here it is. Okay, so this is Klein Creek Farm in uh, DuPage County. Um, this is, they had two pigs at the farm and there was this t uh, tiger swallowtail, male tiger swallowtail. Very, very interested in pig pen because males gather minerals from uh, the urine and uh, the poop uh, of various animals. They need that in order to uh, get into their breeding conditions. So uh, it was kind of cute. These, these are, are you know, fairly young pigs and they were uh, chasing that butterfly around. Um, I had more, more fun watching uh, that than I did when they were eating. They were eating uh, when I had given them a bucket full of uh, potato peelings and eggshells. And, um, uh, it was it was a little fun to watch him eat, but it was really fun to watch him chase after the butterfly. Now I think if that video worked, then maybe this one will too. This was um, after the butterfly landed, um, and it, um, this practice is called puddling, and they'll do it in, sometimes along the riverbank. Uh, sometimes I'll go. Um, wherever they they feel they can uh, get a, a good quantity of minerals but uh, here the um, with the amount of uh, deposits that had been made uh, in this dirt here that butterfly i'm sure got just what he needed and is probably ready to go off and, and uh, be a daddy swallowtail now so um yeah, I tromped around a few forest preserves this weekend and um, then I got a tick on me when I was gardening in front of my house this morning. Now, I can't be 100% certain um, if this is the same tick I, I flicked off of me when I was walking in the house the other night after I'd been out uh, in, a, in a different preserve. But um, I wanted to show you uh, the pattern on the back of this. Um, a few weeks ago we looked at a female dog tick. They have uh, a dark brown back and then they have a light ring behind their head, which we call the necklace. This is a male um, dog tick and it is um, wearing what we call its suspenders. Can I zoom in here? Uh, I don't think I can. You know what, let me get out of slideshow mode here and then we can zoom in. Um, He's a little bit dented because I was holding him between my thumb, uh, my thumbnail and my uh, index finger while I was trying to get my camera out with uh, my other hand. So he had a little bit of a dent. Didn't slow him down at all. I'm sure he was just fine. Um, up here are the mouth parts that will dig in and um, uh, start the feeding process and then uh, here are the one, two, three, four sets of legs. Uh, ticks are arachnids, but you know uh, the young ticks, the nymphs, um, they actually only have three sets of legs. So if you've, um, if you've got a teeny tiny little creature on you and you count and it's, it's got six legs, you, you might be tempted to think, oh, it's just some kind of bug. I don't have to be worried about it taking a blood meal from me, but um, it might just be a, a young, a young tick in a prior stage of development. So just just be wary, they are everywhere this year. Nope. 
notes. All right, let's go back. Uh, yeah, you know what? Let's do this. So this is something that was kind of cool and may in fact turn into a column too. I was, as I mentioned, I was doing a little gardening this morning and uh, I was putting uh, the plants that I got at the Wild Ones plant sale. Thank you very much, Kim. Finally, I was getting those in the ground. Um, but I was also moving around some wild ginger. And I, I don't know how you guys are, but I'm always a little hesitant to break up a clump of plants because I'm afraid I'm going to hurt them. And in this case, I sliced the shovel in and I immediately saw, this is the, the wild ginger flower right here. Um, very nondescript. Sometimes they're a little bit deeper maroon color. Uh, this one was, was fairly brown looking. Um, but look at what else was there. This is cicada. I woke it up and I double checked. I didn't hurt it. Um, it but it was, it was certainly a surprise. Uh, it's a few weeks uh, probably uh, at least a couple weeks before it's going to start clawing its way out. Look at, um, see if we can get in even closer. This isn't the clearest picture, but um, unlike the, the adult cicadas that we have in the trees making all the noise, the, um, the nymphs that are underneath the ground, they are uh, feeding uh, usually on tree roots uh, and they have these digging uh, these forearms, uh, forelegs that are made for digging so they can crawl around. They're much better adapted to being underneath the ground than they are being on top of the ground. But it was just kind of a cool thing. And the fact that I was um, digging around a plant that was blooming and then I unearthed the cicada, I thought that's enough of a sign. Uh, the gardening universe is telling me to just leave this plant where it was. So I put the cicada back in the ground. I covered it up. Uh, hopefully uh, I'll see it again in a few weeks. But they are there. And I, uh, just like last week when we talked about the uh, the glowworm that I found when I was gardening in the dark, uh, just always be aware of whatever you're doing. Um, you're, you're always moving somebody's home around. It might be something big that you can see, like a cicada. It might be something uh, microscopic. But it's all connected. All right, let's see. Let's go to our next slide. Oh, that one's a little clearer. Let's zoom in on that one. Now you can see those digging forelegs. Look at the, it's kind of like Popeye, you know, got those uh, greatly enlarged forelegs. And that's what they do. They've got the sharp spines on the front and they, they use that to, to dig around, um, push themselves down through the ground and um, find a, a root to attach onto. Here we can also see the, uh, the wing pads. Um, that's where the wing is going to come out and then fluid will course through the veins and the wing will enlarge uh, after the cicada sheds for its very last time. If I've got them, I bet you you do too. So Susie, have to thank you for this and um, actually Jerry, have to thank you for this. You guys have dueling uh, uh, wolf spiders. Uh, this is a group of spiders, the, uh, the wolf spiders, instead of uh, suspending an egg case in some anonymous web somewhere, they carry it around with them. They attach the egg case via uh, silk to their bottom where their spinnerets are. This allows the female to still move around and I think they do feed still at this stage. Uh, there's another spider we're going to look at called a fishing spider and they carry their egg cases up uh, with their mouth parts so um, it's impossible for them to feed but I, I believe that she is still able to um, feed as she's carrying her young around and uh, defending them. Um, Susie, I thought this was kind of cute. It was a very modest picture. You've got the leaf there uh, covering up her abdomen. Oops, I know her, um, her, uh, let's, let's zoom in on this. There we go. 
uh, I know her eggs here, you can see they're just about ready to burst. The young spiderlings are going to come out. Um, they're light in color. They, they come out of that egg sac and they immediately climb up onto uh, mom's abdomen. So then she continues her maternal role of protecting them for uh, at least one molt. Um, I don't know if it's two molts before they leave, but um, I think there is some uh, eating of each other that occurs on the back of mom too, but uh, pretty cool. Uh, and again, keep your eyes open because wolf spiders are pretty common and this is a, a phenomenon though that is not uh, that easy to see because the female does try to um, uh, protect herself because she's got her family on her back. All right, let's go. And then Susie also uh, dug up this uh, uh, moth that's pupating. Pretty sure it's a moth species. Never did figure it out. There's um, the larger ones. Like if, if this um, if this pupa, let's zoom in, zoom. If this pupa had a visible um, uh, see, I learned proboscis, but everybody else says proboscis. Um, if this had a long tube here that was visible and somewhat um, pushed away from the body, then we know that we were looking at some sort of uh, sphinx moth. Um, if it was a little bit larger and, and um, had a couple of structures down here, we might be looking at an imperial moth. I don't know what this is, but Susie, you have said you're going to take one for the team, right? You're going to put this in a jar? Yep, in, uh, in a see. jar in the kitchen. All right. <laughs> Don't shake it on your eggs or anything. <laughs> uh, we're going to see what comes out of this pupa that was in the ground. Um, so so that's not all caterpillars uh, shed and form a chrysalis or um, spin silk and, and create a cocoon. There are some that just shed one more time in the ground and um, bide their time in the soil until it's time to come out. So yeah, stay tuned on this one and we'll see if we can figure out what the moth is once it appears. Thanks, Susie. Now, you know, mentioned um, uh, Dolomites, the fishing spider. This, uh, this is Trisha. I don't know if you're there, if you're, you're awake, but um, this was at your son's house, I believe. Um, check this out so dartboard for comparison um, that and I, I, I had another one but for some reason it didn't upload let me I think this is hold on let me see yeah this is the last picture in the sequence so I don't know uh, where it is we'll probably be doing more on fishing spiders as we go through the summer because they are really neat and they are pretty um, unmistakable uh, the this one this isn't the spider that um, hatched out of an egg, you know, a couple of weeks ago and grew really fast. This is a spider that is overwintered. Um, she will mate with a male at some point uh, this summer. And then, as I mentioned, she will carry her eggs around up here at the, uh, the front of her head and with her mouth parts. And uh, she'll go without food while she does it. So she'll get smaller and smaller, skinnier, kind of deflated looking. And then she'll spin what's called the nursery web. So she'll go um, find some, some upright stalks or um, stems and she'll make, uh, it's, it's not terribly orderly. It's not like an orb web, but um, it's sort of like a hammock actually. <laughs> Uh, and uh, the, the babies then hang out in there and she hangs out nearby guarding them as they grow and frolic like little spiderlings do. And um, so that's, uh, that's how they get their name, Nursery Web Spider. So be on the lookout for these. Uh, I know I remember last year being out with uh, some of the nature nerds on a walk by the Batavia Dam. Uh, we found one that was between the rocks. Um, when I used to work at Red Oak uh, down in North Aurora, they were always, they would come out in the afternoon and warm themselves on the, the front of the little cave that's at Red Oak. Um, and then when we would teach uh, wetland ecology over at Otter Creek Bend, I'd always find a, a fishing spider and the vegetation uh, along Otter Creek. We taught that program in September and that is the time when the uh, 
nursery web has been created and the uh, youngsters have been, uh, they've hatched and they're developing uh, with mama's watchful eye. Um, all right, you know what? I'm going to stop this share because we've got some more chats here to get to. And um, we got to figure out a way to access the chats while we're actually talking about these things because now i got to remember what we were talking about. Um, oh, and you know what? I'm glad, uh, Kelly and Greg, you could hear the birds earlier. You'll notice now we can't. We're transitioning from the day shift to the night shift. Besides that song sparrow, the uh, the chimney swifts were up above my head. I don't know if their chatters came through or not, but uh, they've gone uh, to bed for the night. They uh, the chimney swifts here at Potawatomi head over to the uh, the pool building, and there's a, a chimney there that they uh, spiral down into, um, and. Uh, <sighs> McFarland, you had a uh, red wing fledgling on the ground today. The parents were upset and <laughs> kept buzzing. Well, so, oh, uh, this is good to know. So some red wings are already fledging. So, um, yeah, this is when the parents uh, kick into overdrive. So, so watch your head. Uh, if you can keep your eyes on them, they, remember, they don't fly towards your eyes. Uh, some people will put sunglasses on the back of their head. And I know of at least a couple of people who put googly eyes on the back of either uh, their uh, baseball caps or um, in the case of <sighs> rides on the uh, bike trail uh, on the back of his bicycle helmet. Um, let's see, female red wing in uh, Mount St. Mary's this afternoon. They, they are pretty, aren't they, Mike? Yeah, they, they yeah. have a little bit of orange flesh to them. Yeah. She was very pretty, and I didn't know what it was, and I was so glad you showed a picture of her now. Yay! Yay! <laughs> well, it sounds like she was behaving herself, too, which she I mean, was, you were behaving yourself. Me. She was behaving herself, but she was, she was had the habits of the Red Wing, and I'm thinking, oh, I wonder what she is, I didn't, or what it was. I had no idea. Now we know. Now I know. I was That's so happy. Thank you so much. I learned something tonight. Hey. <laughs> Uh, and Diane, you're seeing catbirds and staghorn. Yeah, staghorn has that same dense, uh, sort of messy growth. I would imagine that they they like that too. That's a good, good thing to keep in mind. We we had a pretty decent uh, stand of sumac at uh, Hickory Knolls that, um, for some reason, uh, previous manager had decided he was going to kill it all. So it's it's starting to come back a little bit, but um, uh, so. Keep in mind that any uh, elderberry, staghorn, sumac, anytime you've got a thick, um, tangled growth, uh, and then you hear a bird that's going on and on and on, you're probably listening to a cat bird. Um, is this a water bug that sometimes carries a bubble of air? I think so. I think they can capture it with their rear set of legs, and they carry it down, and then they can um, uh, use it as a... You know, like a diving bell. I'm not a hundred percent sure though. Um, I could double check that. But this was um, an insect that was found in the pond, not in uh, Fearson Creek. And that ability to um, either carry a water bubble underneath the water or have some sort of structure that sticks out and breathes air like the water scorpion it's pretty, uh, pretty typical of those still water organisms. So I, I want to say that they do, but again, I'm not, I'm not a hundred percent sure. Um, I w while I had some time, I, I kind of googled it while I was <laughs> waiting. Oh, what, what did and, you find? <laughs> well, I, I thought it was just a specific, specific um, water bug, but as it turns out, um, several different kinds of insects that live in the water do that okay so, so it, it's quite likely that it does but um okay I'll, I'll do i'll do some more research and let you know yeah well you know i remember i think it was some of the diving beetles do that right. they've actually got like some extra hairs or mm -hmm. hairy structures on the ba their back legs that lets them capture the bubble and, and pull it down with them cool yeah see what else you find out okay i'll let you know <laughs> um Ooh, uh, several butterflies puddling on the remains of a raccoon carcass. Mmm. You know, it's funny, butterflies, I used to uh, 
do, do a butterfly pr program and I would always start off by saying, you know, butterflies are easy. If when we're doing a program on snakes, if we're doing a program on spiders, there's a lot of times uh, we have to spend some time getting people, you know, over on, you know, come to the, that side. I'm not going to say dark side, but the, you know, that other side. Um, overcome the, the squeamishness or the, you know, getting over the slithering or the way the spider moves but in the case of the uh, butterflies I thought you know we had it made until I found out a people there's some people who are afraid of caterpillars and B yes they can puddle on some really disgusting things <laughs> um, and let's see Susie said remind oh right of a kid playing hide-and-seek thinking we couldn't see them behind a pole <laughs> Was so was that the uh, the red wing Susie? No, that was that spider. Because oh, she was she stayed there for a really long time, thinking I couldn't see her. Yeah, if you, if she couldn't see you, then you can't see her, right? <laughs> <laughs> and it just reminded me of little kids, you know, standing behind yep. a pole, and you're not supposed to be able to see them. No, you can't see. Yeah, cats do that too. Yeah, <laughs> I close my eyes, you're not there. <laughs> If I close my eight eyes, if I cover them up. <laughs> well, you know, um, Lori, uh, you're mentioning the remains of a raccoon. I, um, we were going to do one more segment tonight, but I don't know. I think we, we've lost the light. Um, I think I'll save this for, for next time. I'll just give you a little sneak preview. So I had this, this nice bag sitting here and it's, it's, it's not my bag, <laughs> so that's why it's so nice. Um, it was a, a gift that uh, someone had brought to the office. Um, what we were going to do is we were going to talk about um, raccoon skulls. So I'll just do a little, oh, this will look nice and creepy. Um, raccoon skulls. Ooh, look at that and um, comparing them to uh, opossum skulls. So we're gonna, we're gonna save this and I will put it earlier on the agenda for next week. Um, I also have another surprise skull in here that I found when I was gardening today. So just another reason to tune in and get some good nature. Um, I hope you had a chance to visit the, uh, the peak registration uh, site and uh, you plan on joining us at least a few times this summer. Um, I know a couple of you had contacted me and said, is there any way I can register for multiple weeks at a time? Um, I tried to figure it out. I was not successful. I know a couple of you said that you had figured it out before, but I don't remember if, if that was peak or if that was um, whatever the registration was we used before this one. But... Um, <laughs> Do a week at a time we, if, if it's not too much of a hassle. I know some of you say you do a month at a time, so then it's not so uh, tedious. You do three or four. Um, maybe be good to yourself, take a week off now and then. Uh, I might do that. I don't know. I don't really have any plans at the moment, but if it looks like there's going to be a Tuesday that I can't make it, I will give you uh, ample notice in advance. So then you can do something with your Tuesday night too. With that, does anybody else... Uh, yeah, Meredith does a month at a time. Um, Susie, I think you said you do a month at a time. I do. At um, the end, at, as you're checking out, it says, do you want to add another? And then you go back to the original screen. Do, so you, do, you, still, do you still have to plug in all your... Well, I guess it's just asking for what name, a phone number, and an email. Yes, you do have to do all that. Okay. But the yeah, remembers it. So all you do is yes, yes, yes. You know, I should ask around. Um, we actually have people who are registration professionals here at the park district. I should see if there's a way that they could have it. So you've got a shopping cart, and you can just put, you know, a month's worth at a time. And I'll, I'll I'll see if I can find it out. But I I was not able to figure it out on my own. Big surprise, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody. Thank you so much. Uh, we made it through. Uh, it's not uh, even sprinkling yet, um, but I don't want to tempt fate since um, 
I'm on IT guy's good side right now, so I'm going to try to keep the equipment dry. And um, we'll pack things up for this evening, and I will see you back um, hopefully next Tuesday night. Uh, might try this setting again, or we might, uh, might go somewhere else. Appreciate your time tonight, everybody. Have a great rest of your week. Take Thank care. Thank you, Pam. Thanks, Bye. Pam. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good Bye. one. Thanks, Thank Pam. You, Pam. Bye, everybody.